Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Morrison Library and to our annual student reading for Story Hour. This is actually our last annual student reading. Uh, at this time, I'd like to, to ask you to silence your cell phones. And I'm going to introduce Vikram Chandra and also thank him for all of the wonderful work that um, both him and Melanie have done in the series over the years. And so I have a binder for you of all of the flyers of all of the Story Hour events. And also this book is um, uh, from our East Asian Library, done by our librarian, um, Deborah Rudolph, and a card. So thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Uh, so yeah, so I guess some of you must know, be aware that this is the very last story reading. We've been doing it, I think, for nine years now. Uh, and uh, I think Melon, 10, really? Yeah, 2008, 2009, series. Oh, wow, okay, 10. Uh, uh, um, and so Melanie and I just got so busy recently that I think it's, and, and we thought ten, this was a nice round number, 10, to bring it to a close. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanna say that the library will keep organizing events, uh, especially there's gonna be uh, what they're calling book events organized by librarians. So keep a lookout for that. And then there are lots of other uh, discussions going on, on about, um, uh, how to carry on the legacy of the series, and there's going to be an undergraduate lunchtime series at Moffat. Right? Uh, so keep your eyes open, and you'll see something else taking the place of this. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce our first reader, Cheryl Barbera. Uh, she was born and raised in Thousand Oaks, California. Cheryl is working on finishing school with the hope of one day becoming an English professor. Cheryl, welcome. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna be reading uh, an abridged version of my piece, Dear Estrella. I don't think about you as often as I should. Thoughts of you come creeping up to me in odd ways. I'll smell dead grass in the sun, and that'll be you sometimes, but not all the times. When I'm driving, it's nothing but grass, but if I'm walking or if I'm barefoot and I can smell the warm grass and the blackness of the asphalt, then it's you. When I watch the fireworks from my balcony, I taste cherry and lemon and blue raspberry, and I try not to cry, feeling the ghost of your hands slipping through my fingers. I can go days without thinking about you, weeks, and I'm sure there must have been a year where I didn't think about you and your bracelets and your laugh. But when I do think about you, it's all that I can think about. You consume me from beyond the grave or wherever it was you went when you disappeared. In my memories of you and the land without sidewalks, it is always summer, always overheated and long and sweaty, and the afternoons would all melt into a thousand hours spent getting sunburned and playing with you in the front lawns of our father's houses, running barefooted across the blistering black street and pacing down the curbs, arms out for balance. No one could walk across the curbs as fast as you could with so much skill. On that 4th of July, I found you at the park with the sidewalks where we all went to watch the fireworks. I remember nothing but you and you and you until the sun set, until after the sun had set. And then I remember the first boom of the fireworks starting, how the sound shook everything to a stop. Until that year, I had always watched the fireworks sitting on the Mexican blanket between my mother and father, overshadowed and babyish. But then that year in the sandbox, with only you and the other kids, I felt tall then, 100,000 feet tall, like all I had to do was stretch out my neck and I could lick the glitter from the sky and it would taste like pop rocks, cherry, lemon, blue raspberry. And you tried to pull on my hand, tried to pull me away. And I couldn't hear the jangling of your bracelets over the sound of the sky being bombarded with colors. I dug my bare toes down into the sand, past the warm layer, down to where it was damp and cold. And I didn't even glance at you, eating up the colors that rippled across the sky. I didn't even notice when you let go of my hand. I only noticed once the fireworks had disappeared that you had to. Words didn't have the same weight to them way back then. Words like kidnapped and taken meant little to nothing to me. Just words that were used in faraway places television shows occupied. 
Missing was for small Barbie shoes that were always lost. Vanished was when Tuxedo Mask on Sailor Moon would throw down a smoke bomb and would pull his cloak around him, and he was gone. But he would be back the next week. You weren't back that next week, or the one after that, or the one after that. One afternoon, a few weeks after you had gone, I left my father's house as he slept, sweating on the couch in the front room. Barefoot, I went down to the driveway to where the sidewalk wasn't, and I walked along the bleached bone curb, arms out like airplane wings, looking down resolutely at my toes to keep my balance. I went past seven houses, all the way down to the street corner, and I stopped where the sidewalk began. In my mind, you were somewhere out there, laughing and banging your bracelets together, and all I had to do was follow like I always did. And there you'd be, laughing and asking why I took so long. Perhaps you were one block away, or two, and all I had to do was keep on walking. But I'd never been down past the street corner on my own before. I stood there where the sidewalk started, and the sun began to drip lower and lower, all yoky and yellow, and I was terrified. I was only in the third grade and my ears weren't pierced yet, and so at last I turned around and went back the way I'd come, all the way up the street, balancing on the curb, like we had done so many times before. But all those times, you had been there behind me, telling me to go faster, to stop being afraid, to stop thinking that I'd fall, to stop being such a baby. I went slowly all the way back to my father's house, and once I was inside, I shut the door and I locked it. All right, and I have the joy of introducing Zachary Kaibach Burbano. He is a third year English undergraduate, currently finishing his thesis on the work of poet Susan Howe. He has interned at McSweeney's, and his fiction has previously appeared in the UC Berkeley Art and Design Inaugural Showcase and the Cal Literature and Arts Magazine. Last semester, he facilitated a peer-led campus workshop on flash fiction, and this semester, he is happily employed as a dog walker. Hello. Um, so this is kind of the beginning in a bunch of spliced sections from a piece I worked on last semester. Um, since I figured it's kind of told as a series of like non-sequential vignettes, so I thought it'd be good to kind of just mash together and see if it worked. Um, but it's called Moment of Impact. Begin the narrative in medias res. As Tucker leaned over the parking brake to sash his tin of Sunbury-flavored chewing tobacco into the glove box, Cosmo saw smoke rising from the hood of his Toyota Camry. Moving upwards with a lazy virulence, it obscured the windshield as the car barreled down the I-40 west toward Los Angeles. They had been driving for 10 hours nearing Albuquerque. Any passing thoughts of Towanda, Kansas were swallowed by the New Mexico sunset, seeping yellow over the horizon line like a large, bloodied egg. Cosmo shifted. The car shuddered. The engine began to whine. Cosmo closed his eyes and let his body spread across the cheap Valor upholstery like a slab of slowly melting margarine. His breathing grew shallow. As the car swerved into the lane of oncoming traffic, Tucker spit his chewing tobacco onto the dashboard with an emphatic fuck and slammed the brakes. The noise rose, and Cosmo felt the car beginning to tilt. As the back two tires left the tarmac, Cosmo put his arm around Tucker's shoulder and began to laugh. Forward, quick cut. Tucker's timeline first collided with Cosmo's the same way his car would later collide with an emergency telephone pole on the I-40 West. The telephone was the only one in five mi miles from either direction, despite the standard two-mile spacing on most Midwestern highways. When Cosmo stumbled out of the passenger seat, he felt a vague sense of irony as he called for the ambulance with the same metal fixture that had crushed the front of Tucker's car like an empty Pepsi can. Its unapologetic verticalness offended him, rudely penetrating the straight-edged division of Carolina Lovegrass and milky blue sky. His head ached. Move to the very beginning. Their first impact in the parking lot of Circle High School. 
Cosmo clambered into the passenger seat of Tucker's Camry with the same lack of coordination he would later exhibit staggering out of it after the crash. This first impact, however, lacked any physical momentum other than that of two disproportionate human bodies, a light touch on the shoulder and an uneasy handshake. A furtive glance in the rearview mirror, a shiver. Tucker grunted. You're Cosmo. Yeah. How much? I have 60 bucks. Tucker looked at him. Cosmo felt his palms grow damp. He sat on the opposite side of the room of Tucker during film class, but they never spoke. Tucker hulked in the driver's seat, arms crossed in a way that made his biceps pop like major league baseballs. That much? I have the real shit, too. It's for my friends, Cosmo, asset, Cosmo said. Tucker looked at him and stuck a piece of chewing tobacco between his gum and bottom lip, scratching his head. It reminded Cosmo of how his neighbor's Holstein cow chewed on its cud. I have friends in Wichita, Cosmo stammered, from working retail. Tucker paused. For a moment, he almost looked sympathetic. The expression sat awkwardly upon his frame, contradicting the aggressive contours of his hulking body beneath a sleeveless burgundy t-shirt. He sighed and spat into his cup. If you say so, he said, please don't fuck up with this. Cosmo took out his wallet. He counted out the money in $5 increments, depositing the bills into the cup holder. Tucker looked visibly uncomfortable. Cosmo, please don't let him fuck up with this. He's old now. Cosmo avoided his eyes and took the orange pill container. After the accident, Cosmo thought the hospital waiting room smelled like expired laundry detergent. It was an identical scent to the generic powdered stuff his father bought at Walmart, which caked the sides of the box whenever Cosmo forgot to close the lid between loads. The nurse bought him a turkey sandwich and a mango fruit cup. He felt sick to his stomach. How's Tucker, he asked. The nurse didn't respond, choosing instead to adjust the volume of the small television on the table to his right. Cosmo looked at the screen. A woman in a dark red dress was yelling at a man that looked like a cheap knockoff of George Clooney. They stood next to a swimming pool. Er, they stood next to a swimming pool. Cosmo picked up his spoon and opened the fruit cup. Can you please just tell me if he's all right or not? The nurse looked at him, biting her lower lip. Cosmo averted his eyes. The woman pushed George Clo the George Clooney doppelganger into the water. He flailed in the direction of the camera as if trapped beneath the screen. The production made the entire scene look fake, but Cosmo found it extremely satisfying. He wondered how much it would cost to stage a car accident. A moment of impact, a body collapsing into chlorinated water. The nurse coughed and walked into the other room. Another type of impact. Cosmo, his name decided after his parents visited Meteor Crater near Winslow, Arizona. A cosmic dash in the southwestern desert, a nickel iron meteorite measuring 60 meters in diameter. In an astrophysics lecture, his father said that there are over 100 ring-like structures on Earth recognized as definitive impact craters. Only a few of these are immediately recognizable to the untrained eye. An invisible impact. Most meteors burn up in the mesosphere. Bodies that break through the troposphere often vaporize as they collide with the Earth. Cosmo never went to Tucker's funeral. Thanks. And now I get to introduce Christina Chan. And Christina Chan is a first year intended integrative biology major, also majoring in music and bio E. Besides academics, she enjoys writing, playing piano, golfing, and going out into nature when the sun is out. Hello. Um, I'd just like to preface my reading and let you all know that I wrote this quite a few months ago for the Lili and Fibuli and Eric Hoffer essay prize around the topic of advice for the new chancellor before she had been chosen. So here goes. To Mr. or Mrs. New Chancellor from a humbled student. Quite frankly, you have yet to be chosen and perhaps I'm simply writing to a current figment of my imagination. However, in this loose leafed existence of our chancellor lies such beauty because there exists a knowledge that amongst all of the current uncertainty, you are an absolute set in the future. Nevertheless, welcome. 
Welcome to the hot seat of one of the finest universities of the world. Welcome to the position that is in such public display that no matter what step you take, it may be put under scrutiny. This welcome, in light of how it may seem, is the most honorable welcome of them all. Just as the presidency of any country is placed under the same parameters, let me say this. You are a brave soul and an ambitious individual, an inspiration under fire. If you are reading this now, what I wrote about you not existing may seem silly. After all, you are a living, breathing human, a member of the homo sapien species of Earth. Yet, in this vague humor of your previous non-existence lies one of the greatest pieces of advice I hope I can offer you. To begin, you first have to realize that there exists some disillusionment as students wonder where the university's leadership stands. Why did all the uncertainty begin in the first place? Well, the university goes beyond a campus for education. It is a collective of voices that must be heard. The concern of one may just as well be the concern of all others. After all, each and every one of us, if placed in their position, may feel the same. As a result, you should make the students' concerns your concerns. Notice, in my writing, I did not dwell on the in-betweens that came between the uncertainty of the chancellor's seat and the subsequent fulfillment of it. The students of this campus may never know what work went into making this moment possible. But the real importance is that the moment has come. We have a new chancellor. My advice to you is to view the plans you'll make as a forecast of absolute possibility. Whether or not the audience of this public university agrees with the weather, do what is within your capability to establish the university's own white clouds that will bring good weather about. There may be inescapable attributes and factors such as the sun. However, use it to your advantage. Protect the children of this great university from metaphorical sunburn and drought. Turn the harmful UV rays into evaporation of water and create the beautiful white clouds that can protect us. There may be steps back or lightning storms that may seem dreary, destructive, disagreeable. After all, that is the weather. But keep optimistic with the bigger picture in mind. Lightning storms? Well, at least fiat lux. Best wishes, a letter from the past sent to the future. Thank you. And up next is Irina Popescu, and she is finishing up her doctorate in comparative literature here at Berkeley. Writing has always been a central part of her life, and even in the craziness that is grad school and being a parent, she still manages to find a bit of time to pursue her passion. Hello, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm actually the awkward one that's gonna do a little interlude and, and, and kind of interrupt story hour with two poems that actually started out as short stories and then I kind of condensed them into these prose pieces. Um, okay, the first one is called From Namu to God. I kinda wanna be a dog, over being human. As dogs, we could sniff our butts instead of saying hello. How great would that be? See a butt you like, stop, turn, Run towards said butt, take one or two or even three long sniffs. Acceptable in dog culture? Weird if you don't sniff. Humans just walk around saying how are you and not meaning it. I hope I'm a pit bull. They get a bad rap, but I'd be the coolest pity around. I'd lay on your lap and run marathons with you. I'd have a black patch on one eye like a pirate. I'd have a cute snore that you would record and put on YouTube. It would get more hits than that crazy human baby snoring. Who cares about baby snores? I'd listen to jazz and demand belly rubs. I'd understand my place in the world. My name would be Callie. You wouldn't know if I were male or female, and it wouldn't matter. That would cement my coolness. Did you know dog is God spelled backwards? There's something in that. Human? Human is Namu, spelled backwards. Namu 
sounds like an Indian curry dip. That's the best we got. Pretty sure dogs have us. Clever species. Sat together one day long ago. Look at that funny two-legged type. They seem weak and vulnerable. Let's sleep in their beds. Let's get them to give us peanut butter. Let them pick up our shit. Really makes you rethink creation, doesn't it? And in another <laughs> kind of realm, this poem is called Tree. If I plant a leg of a table, will a redwood sprout? If I massage its base, will sap reappear? I bet trees found a clever way of surviving our axes and desires for artisanal dressers, a burrow deep within their ancient core, or a tender seed waiting with the patience of a vengeful god to reproduce. Sequoia. Looked it up once. Sequoia sounds cool and dry and coy, real and magical, prime material for table making. When a parent redwood dies, a new generation arises, surrounding the deceased. Undisturbed switch between death and life. They're called fairy rings. My fingers drag across the table's essence. I wonder what part of the tree I touch. The rustic design feels like a new technology. It's raised knots, hieroglyphs. Thank you. Okay. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Joe Staley, and he has quite a bio, so I'm going to read it and do it justice. So Joe is a graduating transfer student from CCSF, majoring in English and minoring in creative writing. But after many years of bouncing around the globe as a sponsored skateboarder, which is like the really cool part, he returned to the Bay Area in 2011 and shifted his focus toward education, a focus he never imagined would afford him the opportunity to study at Cal. He is currently applying for grad programs in education, and afterwards he plans to pursue a career in teaching in California. So welcome, Joe. Hello. Um, this is kind of a uh, condensed beginning to a, a piece called uh, Things to Do in a Rental Car When It's Raining. Um, <clears throat> listen to jazz, unfamiliar jazz. None of your favorite things, no blues train. Find the local station and just let it ride. It's got to be jazz, rain music, atmosphere. Jazz moves with the rain. They dance together. They are one. The plucked bass reverberates through each rainy puddle. The piano strides and shifts with the falling precipitation. Brass breathes through the nighttime air as the cymbal crashes and drum beats set the pace for the weather's wet wonderlust. Leave the windows down, let the rain inside. It's important to connect with the rain. You're working together tonight. Get wet. Park illegally and take a walk. Leave your jacket in the car and let the rain find you. The body needs hydration. Let the rain soak your neck, let it run down your back, let it explore you thoroughly. Look up and let the rain flood your face, your life. Taste the rain, drink the rain up, become the rain. Walk through each and every puddle, allowing them to invade your shoes. Find your socks, then seat between your toes. Once you're thoroughly wetted, slosh back towards your car. A meter maid is about to write you a ticket. Explain that you were just being one with the rain. She says she understands even though you know she does not. As she drives off, ask if she listens to jazz. Of course, she says, especially when it rains. Thank her while scooping rain from a puddle. Put a handful in your pocket for later. Get back in the car and turn up the heat. Let the moisture collect and write yourself a note on the fogged window. Tell yourself hello, then tell yourself to fuck off. Drive for, the le drive for at least three miles with the windshield wipers off, no matter how much it's raining. Let the rain dictate your movement. If it's a slow drizzle, drive unnecessarily fast. Make wide turns. Don't use your blinkers. Take chances. If the rain decides to lay it on thick, still leave the wipers off. Just slow it down. Watch the blurred lights distorted through the spattering and flowing downpour. Creep along. Barely move. Stop. Wait for a horn. Is it a motorist or a musician? 
Listen to the rain rule the world around you. Love its power. Wait for the rain to tell you what to do next. Listen when the rain speaks. Follow the rain slowly upwards into the twinned peaks, back into a parking spot and leave your lights on. Don't turn around to view the city. That's not why you're there. Besides, you've seen it all before. Instead, watch the people as they arrive like deer in your headlights, confused. Watch them wonder and snicker at you, alone and oblivious to the view. Wave to them and listen to the rain and the jazz. Point to the window that reads, fuck off, and realize that for them it's written backwards. Hope the deer in your headlights are dyslexic. Return to the road, return to the rain. Watch it bead on the windshield like sweat on a rocks glass. Watch the rain get rhythmically wiped away like an empty drink. Watch it collect and again get wiped away, like rounds two, three, four. Think of scotch. Think of how much you miss scotch. Think of rainy, scotch-filled days of the past. Remember the taste of scotch, its warmth, its weight, weight that somehow took away lives. Then remember whiskey. Miss whiskey less than scotch. Remember rainy days flooded with whiskey. Remember sour breath and hot shots thrown back quickly. Remember mistakes. Remember the gutter. Exhale your breath and watch it meet with the cool outside air. Watch them dance together, mingle. Remember cigarettes. Remember smoking. Think of all the cigarettes in your lifetime. Smoke imaginary ones while you do. Remember your first cigarette. Remember the brand. You know you can. Think of the first pack you bought. Think of the second. Think of the brand you both smoked when you still talked to each other. Think about all the cigarettes you smoked while you drank scotch and whiskey. Put out your imaginary cigarette. Light another. Remember the gutter. You know you can. Then think of all the cigarettes you smoked while you climbed out, when you couldn't drink anymore, when all you could do was smoke. Think of the brand you smoked then. Remember the last pack you bought and how you decided to ruin cigarettes for yourself. Think of how they began to taste sour and hot, like whiskey. Think of the gutter. Put out your imaginary cigarette in your gutter. Introduce it to the rain. Smoke the rain instead. Thank you. Thank you.